Good evening and welcome back to Byline. This is a public affairs show of the Amherst League of Women Voters and Amherst Media. And we're using this show over the course of this year to help people understand how our new government is coming together. And most of our guests are uh, members of the uh, government, either town councilors or staff or people who serve on uh, specific committees. Uh, but today we're taking a little bit of a left turn, and that's not a political statement. It's a turn uh, of a bit, uh, a different kind of show because we have two guests from the Amherst League of Women Voters. Uh, but there is a connection to our new town government because uh, this is the first time we've interviewed anybody on the show who's using provisions of the charter that relate to citizens coming forward and presenting resolution to our town government. It's not the first resolution that they will have been taking up. But this is the first time we've had the opportunity to talk with some people about uh, their effort before the town council. And so we'll talk about the substance, but we also want to talk a little bit about the process um, because we want people to understand how to use the tools of our local government. Sure. <clears throat> uh, but in order to really get the context and the frame of reference here, we should start first by knowing who you two are, Diana okay. Stein and Barbara Pearson. And you're both members of the league. Correct. You've both been in town. You've been in town for many, 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 many years. Many, and many, you've been many, many, in many town years. for less, but not, uh, not that many. Not none. Not none. And um, you've both been uh, active and around town. Sure. So let's just take a minute here and, Diana, talk a little bit about uh, what you've done in town government, because you've sure. served in town government. I have. And your role uh, in the league. Okay, um, in terms of town government, I started with town meeting. I was on the select board for six years. I um, am also uh, was a member of the charter commission that helped draft this charter that's running the town government. And currently, I'm a member of the Community Preservation Act Committee, which I love being on. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the league, I have been a member of the health care committee probably for 20 years, um, and I um, currently am that. The uh, League of Women Voters Health Care Committee is working now with other members of Western Mass Medicare for All. Uh, we are part, Barbara and I are part of the hub, it's called, for the Amherst area. Mm -hmm. So you've been active in town, yep. and you've been active in the league for many years. Indeed. Barbara, you're newer to town, but you've been active with the league, and your affiliation, uh, you, you're retired from the university, is that correct? Right. And uh, so tell us a little bit of, yeah. about... So I retired from the university about a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. and I had been following my neighbor, Jackie Wolf, uh -huh. who is, whose name is synonymous with single-payer single health care right. in Massachusetts and I had looked forward to I had actually joined the meetings a little bit before I retired into it mm -hmm. and um, so I joined the league a year and a half ago so that I could work on the health care committee mm -hmm. with Jackie Wolf mm -hmm. who then moved who then left town <laughs> so um, I was willing to I was still very enthusiastic about it and so I'm I've taken over the chairmanship of the league's health care committee, but as Diana said, we now ally ourselves with a more a broader gra grassroots mm -hmm. um, organization. So you're part of a larger coalition here in the region and across the state, also not working partisan. on this concept of right. single payer and now Medicare for all. And we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that and the distinctions and if there is a distinction that you want people to understand. But let's there also is. take another minute, that's good, so we, we'll dig into that in a minute. But let's also take a minute and um, refresh people's minds, especially for those who may be um, younger and may have never heard of the League or those who have not been involved. So the League uh, is quite a, a, quite a senior, a, mature organization. Indeed, it formed as soon as the right to vote came to women. Uh, and will celebrate its 100th year anniversary next year. 
very good and, and the amherst, amherst league is 80 years old this year so we started roughly 20 years after this movement became became a national movement and the purpose of the league is to encourage voting that's a primary one but mm -hmm. we study issues and develop our uh, programs based on that uh, we are nonpartisan. We do not support candidates. That's an important thing to note. But when we study an issue like health care and decide that the way, the appropriate way for a country or a state like ours to carry out health care is through a single payer system, that came to be actually it's even a statewide position. Mm -hmm. And they've become much more directed saying that they support the bills that our resolution supports. That is related to that. So, um, and when you say nonpartisan, it doesn't mean that members of the league um, have to register as independent voters, no. but you have to check your party affiliation at the door so that you can engage in a robust conversation sure. with your friends and neighbors and um, your differences may be rooted in ideology and party, but you're not there to promote your party's interests. Right. Barbara? Well, the, the theme, the current theme for the uh, League is making democracy work. Mm -hmm. So doing whatever we can to make democracy work. Um, when I was deciding, well, where was I going to put my focus and all that energy that I had since I wasn't working, um, I, <clears throat> I saw health care as a kind of a of a way to make sure that we could make democracy work. And in fact, I'm on the national, uh, uh, national committee for um, health care reform. And we in the league? In the league. OK, good. And we have a, um, we have a um, it's bumper sticker. It's not a bumper sticker. It's a slogan. It's a slogan. It's on a bookmark. OK. And it says, healthy people for a healthy democracy. Okay. And we just don't know which way it goes, healthy democracy for healthy people or healthy people for a healthy mm -hmm. democracy. But it seems to me that it's integral. And so it, if the, yes, I'm sorry, please. Well, it, it hits on social justice and racial justice and disparities and corporate malfeasance and all kinds of things that we would be very incensed about. Yeah, so in a way, um, if the government and society can produce the health care access, quality, affordability that people need, then they know that their governmental system is working. Well, then we'll have and, a more democratic and system. Then it, and that's a small D again, not big D, because it's a nonpartisan organization. Right. And so the effectiveness of government affects how people think about their government and therefore how they will right. either participate yes. or not, Thank you. which is all part of small D, small D. democratic <laughs> okay. engagement. So that now we should talk we about the resolution. Well, <laughs> we'll talk about that in just one minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I want to know um, why you decided to uh, file a resolution. Okay. And what did you learn by reading the charter and okay. working on understanding what the benefit would be of taking this resolution to okay. the town council? Well, the first thing is, in terms of the charter, you've covered it. This is a free petition. That's the aspect which allows citizens to bring an issue, and it really can be a single person. You don't even have to be a group like us, mm -hmm. according to the charter. Um, why are we bringing this to? We had a change in government mm -hmm. from town meeting, which I might say right off supported this single payer Medicare for all back in 2000. Mm -hmm. and 2006 again, um, and the town voted 88% in an election on a non-binding uh, ballot question mm -hmm. favoring single-payer health care, Medicare for all. Mm -hmm. So this is something the town has cared about for a long time, but with the change in government, we wanted our town council to be on board as well. Excellent. And the process for doing that was? To draft a petition, a resolution, which mm -hmm. we have. And you're going uh, to be describing that in just a minute. I'm Yes, indeed. And when you draft that, mm -hmm. you submit it. Do you need a certain number of signatures nope. or you just submit it? No. Nope. 
and when you submit it, it we, starts the process in the council. No, the um, it what will happen was uh, we find a counselor who agrees with us and is working with us. Okay. Um, the draft is ninety. 5% complete, we are still tweaking it. Okay. Um, and then you decide um, when you want to bring it to the council. And we want to make sure that we have dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. So we, at this moment, haven't set a date. Okay. But probably sometime this fall, we will bring this uh, resolution to the council to asking them to support and endorse an act establishing Medicare for All in Massachusetts, which is uh, the title of a bill, S683 and House number 1194. Um, and that's what the purpose of this uh, resolution is, to Excellent. get them to support. And so now walk us through the- And I the should add one other thing encourage our state legislators to work on this on issue. Right. And we're lucky in that our uh, Mindy Dobb, our res um, representative, and Senator Joe Comerford support single-payer health care and Medicare for All. Terrific. So why don't you uh, start to walk us through the content <clears throat> of the resolution so we understand the arguments, because I assume there's a bunch of whereases. There are. Okay. There's more whereases than you want to hear today. <laughs> but give us the highlights. Okay. Because we, that's a we very need to, good the public way to needs do it. to understand yeah. uh, what is the reason we should be supporting okay. this. Sure. I think uh, we should start by clarifying whether it's single payer or Medicare for okay. all. Okay. Good. That seems to be a big confusion. Okay. Um, people Go with ask it. it all the time. Yeah. Well, uh, single payer is that uh, a system under which the health care bills are paid out of a single trust, mm -hmm. just like Medicare bills are paid for out of a single trust. This would be a state trust um, in which all the funds would be gathered and the bills would pay, be paid from it. That's what a single payer system is. The point that I want to make is that although the bill says establishing Medicare for All in Massachusetts, it should, in my mind, be uh, read as improved Medicare for All. And the reason is that a lot of people say, but I only pay, uh, Medi my Medicare only pays 80% approximately of my bills, and I have to pay for an expensive Medicap insurance policy, oh, yeah. this is gone under the mm -hmm. bill, okay? You would have all of your medical, medically necessary bills paid for by this trust. You would not have to buy a Medigap um, insurance oh, policy. Yeah. And it covers far more than the current Medicare does. It, covers vision and mental and uh, dental, dental and hearing aids and long-term care even. Mm -hmm. So it's a very um, uh, comprehensive, comprehensive um, bill that is described. So do you know why people shifted from just talking single payer to starting to use the nomenclature of Medicare, Medicare for all. Well, because I found that confusing myself, right. mm -hmm. understanding and having sponsored and supported legislation around single payer, and I understand Medicare, I understand Medicaid as a le former legislator, and I was just puzzling well, because it, I think it added confusion to the debate rather than made it easier. The idea was to make add clarity or to add, um, add something that people could relate could to recognize. and understand and yeah. recognize. So for example, the Canadian system, helpfully or not, is yeah. called Medicare. Okay. <laughs> and we're so, we are very familiar with Medicare. And it's the mechanism of Medicare where you get to choose your doctor. Mm -hmm. You choose your doctor. You don't have to worry about an insurance company telling you which doctors you can go to. And what services they can provide. And what That's services right. they can provide That's or right. not provide, which mm -hmm. is... Right. I mean, cosmetic is not going to be included, 
medically necessary. necessary. Right. But right. acupuncture is even in the bill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if if um, if cosmetic were necessary as a result of an illness, it presumably would be covered because there are diseases, oh, yes, or an accident, right. medical or condition like that. exactly right. Right. that would produce a situation right. where, uh, for the, the for the for the health, health of the individual. Right. Uh, you, you would need to do some reconstruction, and sure. that can be cosmetic. Sure. So people don't under—I mean, people don't really understand our system. Mm -hmm. For example, when I worked at the university, I really wasn't aware how much the university was paying on my behalf. Mm -hmm. I knew how much I was paying, and if you had asked me how much does your insurance cost, I would have given you your what share, I pay. Right. <laughs> And they pay four times as much, right. which turned out to be a huge percentage of my yeah. very low salary. Um, yeah. But so people don't really understand. They don't know what a single payer is mm -hmm. and um, don't really appreciate that we have a multi-payer system. Mm -hmm. I mean, not just a multi-payer system, a mega-payer Medi system. Yeah. But they do appreciate Medicare. Right. Yeah. And when there were the debates going on about the Affordable Care Act, people would say, I don't want the government to buy Medicare. I mean, it showed their love for it, yeah. but also uh, uh, an ability to really yeah. understand it. And that's also another distinction. Um, a lot of times people say, I don't want government doing this. Mm -hmm. but. We're not. We're saying okay. It's a. Right now, we have part. A good portion of our health care is provided through public, through public um, funding, mm -hmm. and a, another portion through private funding. So we've got that distinction. If somebody wants to say, I don't want a government run one. Well, I personally don't want a corporate run one, mm -hmm. because a corporate one has to worry about their shareholders more than they worry about me. And it's patient. profit driven. I mean, yeah. people have to understand. Having profit-driven health care means you're paying a lot of money for something that doesn't deliver any improvement in health care at all. Um, and the U I just would like to set the stage a little bit in that the U.S. as a whole is doing very poorly in terms of health care if you take the statistics. Mm -hmm. For example, life expectancy. There are countries that are living where the people have a life expectancy four and five years longer than we do in the United States. And as Barbara will tell you, it's going down. It's mm -hmm. not going up. Mm -hmm. It should be improving. Um, and part of that is, relates to uh, what percentage of the people actually are covered as well as sure. um, the availability, the access, Absolutely. and the quality of what they're receiving. Right. And when you have 10% of the population uncovered mm -hmm. in a particular jurisdiction or in the country, right. uh, nationally, what are we, 15% uh, uncovered I, I, at this point? And we're much uh, lower here, but we have another huge I mean, percentage who are underinsured. Underinsured, yeah. right, yeah. as well. Yes. Yeah. So we care. have uh, somewhere between 150,000 and 200,000 people who still aren't covered, right. even in Massachusetts, which does better than a lot of other states. Right. Um, and, and, but, but the point that Barbara raised is this underinsurance thing is terrible it's because, enormous, yeah. yeah, because the way you make insurance policies cheaper is you increase the deductibles. So if somebody has to spend $5,000 out of their own pocket, a lot of people just don't bother to get the health care until they end up in the emergency room, which is the most expensive. Expensive form, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it also goes to your point earlier about equity, and because if you have insurance but you can't get the level of service you need, right. it's going to affect our overall data. Sure. Because, you know, let's face it, in a community of, of this nature that we're living in, a very, very high level of insurance, right. high quality insurance. So you see people are living very long and productive lives. The number of people over 90 that I associate with now is stunning. <laughs> but that's in part because they have such good health care. Yeah. And they take care of themselves, and they have the income, and they have the insurance. And so if you don't have... Right. But it's costing the state big time. 
um, the amount, the proportion of the state budget that has been going up uh, from, I think, 2001 to now has gone from 30% of the state budget spent on health care to 45%. Mm -hmm. yeah. And every time you do have that kind of an increase, money gets pulled away from the infrastructure, education, and yeah. so on. When I went into the legislature, we were spending about 18 to 20 percent of the state budget and at that point it was a fraction of what it is now I'm right. going to say it was about 18 17 or 18 billion we're now over 40 billion and it's closer to 42 43 44 percent exactly um, I haven't checked it in a while but you yeah. see that and it's of a much larger number sure. and a much larger percentage right. and in terms of the inequality so one of the things about the profit profit motive of the, um, even for insurance companies that are non-profit, which just means they don't pay taxes, they still have huge salaries, they still have advertising, they still have all these other things. But it doesn't, it seems that the whole country, not just Massachusetts, but Massachusetts as well, doesn't cover the rural areas very well because mm -hmm. it's not yeah. profitable enough. Right. Right. And so they're really pulling back on that and it's just keeps getting worse and worse. What would be benefits to the town and the town's residents that the town council would consider as they're trying to decide what to do about this resolution. Uh, Barbara would be really good to speak on this issue Barbara? because she has studied the finances <laughs> Great. and it's astonishing how much of a help it would so be. So help us understand what, what that looks like for the residents and the town of Amherst. Well, as you know, we want to save money. And um, the corporations, for example, who are doing this, they don't care if it, they charge more for health care because they have no incentive. You charge more, then you pay more in premium. But the, we have to put, you know, the town has to take out of our $85 billion million dollar budget. Um, and currently, they're taking out almost 10%, a little over 10%, about almost $9 million. Mm. Um, if we follow the law on the books, just for the active employees, the teachers and the government workers, not the special funds and stuff like that, we would save more than half. We cut it and in half. More than half. And that's money that could go to, we have big mm -hmm. capital needs there. <laughs> when you cut it in half, that's if you're uneducated about this, you might think, well, if you cut it in half, we're going to be losing something. No. No. So how you do you cut more. it in half without losing something? You have a more rational system, a more efficient system, um, a system that doesn't waste um, almost a third of your medical dollars mm -hmm. on non-medical things. So you have to have, I mean, you so can't just... So advertising and... Bonuses. Promotional and... and Drug okay. and price increases are outrageous, and yeah. the state legislature tried to get... Um, Some a, controls in place. And yeah. that failed yeah. due to lobbying. Anyway, so tell about some of the other things. <laughs> uh, <laughs> some of the other things, my yeah. goodness. Um, so, so it's basically there will be significant, significant savings, savings. Right. and there's and data no and studies to back up, back this up. Absolutely. And it's actual um, savings from, from the beginning, not just savings from road. increased, right. saving uh, a percentage of the increased cost. It starts right from the beginning starts, based right. on your analysis. But it, it has to have strong cost containment. So you can't just, like ACA, you can't just expand mm -hmm who gets health care if, if you can't rein in the costs. So that's why you want to have the single payer, because mm -hmm. you have more control over that. And so a big portion of what you're going to save relates to things that are non-medical. Absolutely. And, that's, and that's in fact, argument. you'll have better, in fact, we're not talking about the, the $9 million that I mentioned, that's for insurance. Mm -hmm. okay? That's not for necessarily for health care. So mm -hmm. we're talking about paying half that for all of your health care. And that's a, that's a different proposition. The, the and other points that... Uh, well, one of the points of the wastage that Barbara referred to is the number of billing clerks that a practice mm -hmm. or a hospital or uh, 
such as Mass General, has to hire to put the right codes in and send the bills to the right insurer. It's outrageous to me that Mass General has as many billing clerks as patients, 450. Hmm. And a similar sized and hospital. That's, that's waste. That's just total waste. And then there's the drug situation. I have to go back to it. In Minnesota, they took a bus of patients who are, require insulin and drove it up to Canada because the insulin up there was something like $32 of whatever the aliquot is. In the, our country, it's 10 times as much. Mm -hmm. That's that's just profit. And I read of another drug that's $50 that they're now charging 20000 That's got to stop. It just, we cannot go on doing this. So that, that's got to be attacked through policy because the, the federal government in particular, but also state governments, right have to do what right. needs to be done to control and that, no matter what the system sure. of delivery But the single-payer system allows negotiation. Uh, Veterans Administration hospitals right. pay 40 yeah. percent of what we pay in the Yeah, others. and again, that's that the policy at the federal <laughs> level is ridiculously says you can't negotiate over seniors' drug prices, exactly. only over the pr drug prices exactly. for the veterans. That's absurd. So meanwhile, um, <coughs> the, um, the I forget. We have okay. 30, seconds 30 seconds for you to make That's that final saw. point. Oh, no. well. Did you lose it? I think I lost it, but it was, but I, it was about the fact that people think it's a free market. Oh, we have oh. a free market. And what you just mentioned, it's absolutely not, not a free, free market. market. We don't have right. any of the market forces yeah. for competition or anything. For, for drug prices is a great example, but also for the... Well, on that note, I'm going to thank you both for being here. And I want to thank you not only for the, the work and explanation that you're doing around our health care costs, but also helping us all understand how to use our town charter to bring an idea to the town government and our elected officials so that they can make a public policy statement in support of the kind of change that you envision as right. local residents you'd like sure. to see happen. Well, thank you yes. for giving so. us the opportunity. Yeah. Great, and thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>